Are you lost in the chaotic whirlwind of day-to-day busyness? Do you yearn for a deeper sense of meaning and purpose in your life? Welcome to Be You, Your Story, Your Purpose, the podcast dedicated to empowering women on their journey of self-discovery and finding their true purpose through their own story. I'm your host, Brenda Simmons. Welcome everybody to the podcast. I'm so glad to have you with me today. I am so excited for my guest today. Her name is Lark Galley and Lark has over 30 years of sales experience. She is even a graduate of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program, which is a big deal. And she has won multiple awards within that sales arena. But she also is an entrepreneur, and she's going to talk to us a little bit today about this journey that she's had, along with some personal trials that she's had along the way that have greatly influenced her life. So, Lark, thank you so much for being here. I'm so, so grateful for your time. My pleasure, and thanks, Brenda. I'm excited to talk to your audience. I think um, as women of mature years, (laughs) we want to make an impact, and we want to know what it, is what I'm doing matters? Is it meaningful? And I think it's it's important. So thank you. Absolutely. And I, I really love your story. I recently saw you present your story, or at least part of it, because I missed part of it, um, at a, a, a conference that we were both at. And I was so taken by what you've overcome and, you know, not and not only that, but the things that you've done that I thought, oh my goodness, I would love to have you on the podcast. So I'm so grateful. So to begin with, you started your career in the corporate world. So yes. tell us a little bit about that story and then your transition into, you know, as an entrepreneur. So I'll tell you, um, I was working for the state of Utah International Economic Development Office when I was getting my master's at the University of Utah in economics. And I will tell you, you know, uh, little woman in the 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 80s the later 80s uh working in an, a very male dominated office slash you know environment it 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 was you know i had big hopes and dreams right and uh, they weren't always encouraged <laughs> and let's just say i ran into a situation where uh, i was blatantly told to my face that the reason i did not get to pr- the promotion that i had been promised was that i was a woman and in 3 years i would be having kids and they couldn't invest any resources in me and wow. i politely played along eventually got to the point where i i filed a human resource complaint the boss slapped you know they got his hand slapped and he apologized but i'm like okay the writing's on the wall right i i really have no place and that's when i shifted into sales and I, I want to say that in some ways I felt devastated because, you know, here I was, I was focusing a lot on, on my career and this government work and in the international arena. And, and I thought, I thought I was going places, <laughs> clearly not. Um, but I will tell you that the day I walked into the sales environment, I lit up. It, it was totally me. It was sort of competitive. It was exciting. You know, who's going to get what? And I 10 times my income over the course of the next decade, right? So I look back at that that small-minded boss and I think what a blessing he was in my life because otherwise I could probably, you know, um, be retiring from government work after 30 years and probably in those 30 years cumulative never have reached the financial resources that I've been able to reach like going out on my own. So sometimes we have things happen to us that is not what we planned and doesn't doesn't look as great on the face, but they're actually propelling us into something new and more exciting and and is beneficial for our growth. And I feel like that's like the theme of my life. Right? Well, and it's so easy to look back and go, oh, that was such a blessing. But in the moment, you're like, this really sucks. Yes. You know, so when you have those moments like that, what helps you to see the bigger picture? I, I absolutely trust in God. And I absolutely know because of some very hard things that I've been through, through my life, that he has my back and that it will be okay. Um, I will discuss later as we go along, but I have learned through hard things that we actually don't control as much as we think we do. Right. Right. Uh, as an A-type personality, I was very much, I control everything. I control my kids. I control my husband. I control my environment. I control this. I control that. And then an event happened five years ago. And I'm like, 
I control nothing. And as soon as I relinquish that control, you know, we, we can control ourselves. We can control our thoughts, what we do, that kind of thing. But that's it. We really don't have as much control as we think we do. And when you can re- relinquish that, that tight grip you have on this concept that is not true, <laughs> you can understand and allow for, for bigger things in your life. You know, my word of the year this year is surrender. And so I'm really (laughs) focusing on this because I have realized that I have such a tight control over, you know, everything. And so then, and and it's amazing because then when things don't work out the way that I try to control them too, you know, Mm -hmm. I take it very personally. And so I was like, I have got to just relinquish this because I can't control it anyway. So I may as well just surrender it. And so Every day I think, okay, well, how, how did I surrender today? How am I doing fulfilling that? And boy, it has been really eye-opening. So many times I'm like, oh no, I can totally surrender that. I don't need that. You know, so it's so it's been a really beautiful thing, but it's hard. It's really hard to give up hard, that control. But you'll have so much more peace in your life yes. when you stop stressing about things that you cannot control. Absolutely. So did that play into going into the entrepreneur world as well? So I went into corporate, you know, and I was with um, a couple different companies. And the the last one being that that Fortune 500 company, I was in um, global sales. I, I had so it was global logistics, which is international transportation traveling all over the world. I had live in nannies because I had little tiny kids and I'm doing all these big things, working with big companies. I lived in the Bay area for a little while and I was um, Packard Bell, Seagate, Mac store. They were, they were three of my customers. (laughs) Then I moved, I moved back to Utah and I had um, a, a big client here. So there was times when I was what's called a global account manager where I had these big accounts and then, and I was doing a lot of operations work at a higher sales level. Um, I actually found that I liked working out in the sales field just in general versus working with these bigger companies immersed in their day-to-day because uh, it was more exciting for me. Uh, I I would, we just looked at it as a competition and it was me and the other guy and uh, I was determined to win. I, I knew I would outwork that the competitor every single time. And, um, and I will tell you, like, through some miraculous ways, uh, I manifested my biggest client in 2005, which is then what led me to earning that that um, number one senior sales rep for the global company, right? Wow. Here's little old me in Salt Lake City, Utah, right? Um, but I laid the groundwork. And everything that I did, I always prepared. I always laid the groundwork. But then I opened myself to um, a bigger way of manifesting that was outside my personal abilities. And I, I think we all have that capability. Okay. I really want to get into that. But before we do, I have a question about sales because so many times sales gets this bad rap, right? And it's, and people think it's a dirty word and And, or it has to be done through, they don't like salespeople because they feel like they're manipulative and, and all that stuff. So give me your sense on what is the value of learning sales? Because now that I've been in sales myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. (laughs) Right. So, so, so tell me your take on sales. Like how can we make that not a a dirty word? First of all, I think it has to do with the integrity of the salesperson, right? For sure. And if I, if, if someone is coming to me and providing me a solution for a problem that I have, I am so grateful. Mm-hmm. And I may or may not have known that, that it was out there or I just didn't understand the benefits. And if someone can come in and explain and lay this all out, right? Um, you've probably heard none of us like to be sold to, but we all like to buy, right? Exactly. Right. Um, and so- in my sales career, as I moved along from kind of being the pushy salesperson, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna close you no matter what, to just interacting with people on a human level and finding out where their difficulty was. And I would I would always go into my clients and like, tell me what's what's 
where's your struggle? What's happening? And even if it was just a tiny piece of their business, that's that's all I wanted. Um, I just wanted to get my foot in the door and I would service them and help them with this one little issue that they would have. And then who do you think they turned to when they had other issues or they saw how we we handled it? And that was one of the reasons why this this new client came to me out of the blue, because it was like, I see how you you and your company are handling this port closure down in Los Angeles, which has been traumatic for every importer in the United States. But the way you manage the information, which was all we could do, was so above and beyond his current provider and the competition that he could see we differentiated ourselves. And that's why he was like, and I know you tried to talk to me before, but I didn't want to see you, but now I want to see you. <laughs> you know, and it's it's staying in integrity and and realizing that if something's not a good fit for someone, don't try to force it. That's just like dirty. Who wants it's to be okay. part of that? Right. <laughs> right. Well, and I, I have found sales is it's all about relationships. Yes. It's really all it is. And that's what you've just described. So that's really beautiful. So my oldest daughter went into commercial real estate, right? And uh, it, it's, it's cutthroat. It's fun. But she, she like me, you know, very aggressive. She loves it. She's excited. She's, you know, prepares herself for it. And, and that's what I tried to explain to her is that um, you're not going to win them all. There is a reason why sales is the highest paid um, career. Because not everybody can do it. And really, not everybody can do it, right? They re they really can't, yep. okay? <laughs> yep. but, um, that's the number one thing to understand is that it's relationship. You need to see the person you're dealing with as another person, another human being with, with what they have in their life and what's going on. And um, it takes some compassion and it takes a willingness to, to do things you might not want to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about manifesting. So, mm -hmm. and I assume that was back in 05. Is that correct? That was 05 for that one. Yeah. But there have been a few things that happened before then, you know, so I was, I kind of understood the skill of this manifesting. Um, it, I will tell you about manifesting though. It takes mental work, which is why most people won't do it because what do you think is harder, physical work or mental work? Oh, mental every day. Yes all the time. Right. And so there have been times when I'm like, I want that. And I'm like, yeah, but do you know how much mental work I'd have to do for that? I'm like, it's just not worth it. Exactly. So I understand, <laughs> you know, it's not like every day I'm like, oh, let's do the mental work. Um, but I had come to a point. I was at five in the morning. I was out jogging in the dark. Okay. I had three young kids between the ages of nine and five. And I'm working in this corporate job and I had just lost a big client. And so I'm 80% commission and I, now my, my commissions, I'm now back earning what I had been earning five years prior. And you know, that, that did That's not a blow. Yeah. That was a big blow you know, yeah. to my ego, to my finances, to the income, the budget, everything. And I'm out jogging and I'm like, this doesn't work for me. And I think we have to come to that point where we draw a line in the sand. We're like, I, this is no longer acceptable to me. And that's where I was at five in the morning out, you know, jogging two miles away from my house on the street near the Maverick. And I just, I just remember that moment because I made that decision. And then I thought, well, what, what am I going to do about this? And I said, um, I can't work harder. And the reason is I'm already, I'm up at 5 a.m. I'm out there jogging, right? I've got these little kids. I get them to daycare or or to school, wherever they need to be. I go into work. I'm there at work, um, you know, by eight o'clock in the morning. And then I, I, there, I'm, I have to pick them up from the daycare by 530, which, you know, it closes at 530. And so I have to be there and juggle all this and then go home. You make the dinner. You spend time with the kids. You put them to bed. And then, you know, you have an hour or two to clean up the house and like go to bed and do it all over again. And I'm just like, I do not physically have it in me to work harder. Okay, my options are to work smarter. What am I going to do? I decided I was going to attract my ideal client. And I and I decided, that I, I made this affirmation that said, I now attract my ideal client for mutual benefit. 
Okay, there's two things here. Oh, I <laughs> Number that. one, I, I didn't want just any client. I wanted an ideal client. And I wanted mutual benefit so that we would both benefit. And I would say it with feeling at least 15 times a day, you know, in a row, 15 times. And I do that several times a day. And then I went in and I told the other managers what I was doing, that I was I was going to be closing a big account very soon. And they just, they laughed at me, you know? <laughs> oh, there's Lark with her crazy ideas, you know, wow. Well, She's back little... then manifesting wasn't really a thing, not no. like it is this now. Was, this was pre the secret. So this yes. was you know, yes. way before, this was like Lark, Lark, we've always suspected she was weird and now we know. So um, I was like, no, this is happening. This is happening. And I just stayed the course and because I knew I didn't have any other options. And I was just like focused on it and so intent. I'm like, no, I know this is the thing. I know this, this client can come to me. I didn't know how. That's not my job. My job is not, I'm not in charge of the how. God's in charge of the how. I am in charge of deciding what I want and staying in that space of believing it, right? And, right. and believing and knowing, like knowing that you can taste it knowing, like it's coming knowing. And I will tell you on that 30th day, I got a call from the largest importer in the state of Utah. And he said, yeah, I don't know if you remember me. And I'm like, yeah, I think I remember you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, you reached out to me a year ago and I didn't want to meet. But now I'm ready to meet. I, I'm, I'm ready to make some changes. So the next day, uh, we set up the appointment for the next day. I cleared my calendar. <laughs> you know, I'm open. I'm open. I'm ready for you. Took two of the other managers with me because this is a big deal. We went in there and it was like a three hour meeting. I'm thinking wow. one hour and it was three hours. And he basically said, yeah, let's start transitioning the business. And with, because his volumes were so big, this was towards the end. This is the end of third quarter. That last quarter, the volumes were so big that it popped me into the number one like position. Wow. Um, yeah. And I look back at that and I'm like, in some ways I didn't do anything. And in other ways I did a lot of things, right? But it starts with that mental work. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And so you and I were talking last week about something and you're like, well, I'd, I'd like to come, but I don't know how it can happen. I'm like, Brenda, first of all, you just see yourself there. <laughs> yep. And I've been working on that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You're like, that's the whole thing is like, you need to, to, Create it spiritually, right? So you see yourself or in the situation that you want. And and that's the hard part. That's the mental work that we don't always like to do. And it's it's having faith and turning off the negative. Yes. And that's the pattern, right? Like that's how creation works. You yes. know, you have to have an idea. You can't go out and build something before a blueprint. You can't have a blueprint before an idea. Yeah. So so you that's that is the law right? It has it to is. work that it way. It is. Yeah. And I will tell you this too, because I'm, I'm talking a lot about money these days. Um, so many times we think that money is tied to, well, I'm a good person, or I go to church, or I read my scriptures. That's not how that works. It's like gravity doesn't work because you're a good person, or you go to church, or you read your scriptures, right? That's, right. That, it's not, that's not the law, right? Exactly. And that's not the law with money. The, 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 the law with money is, has to do with your thoughts and how you treat money and how you want to bring it and welcome it into your life. Okay. So go deeper into that. Okay. So, so many times we look at somebody and say, or we say to ourselves, oh, I'm poor and I'm humble and I'm a good person. Right. And we think, oh, they're, they're so close to God because they're not eating food or whatever, right? <laughs> they're so humble. Right? Yeah, they're, they're eating ramen, right? Or then, but conversely, we look at these people that are rich, maybe that go to our church that are super rich. And we're like, oh, God loves them. God's been blessing them financially. How does that work? How can you be humble and God loves you and blesses you and rich and, and God loves you and blesses you? Like it doesn't make 
sense. There's no correlation there, right? So I would say that the amount of abundance that you have in your life is not tied so much to, oh, I'm a good person. It's tied to, I am on the same frequency and vibration with money. Is that different for every person? Or do you think money has its own frequency? Money has a frequency. Like everything has a frequency. Yeah. And if you want to be at the money frequency, you you need to be vibrating. Okay, so I'm going to say something and I want you to tell me how you feel. Okay. okay. So, All right. Brenda, I love money. Money loves me. I think it feels great. Like, okay. It, it feels exciting. Okay. That's the first thing, right? Yeah. Because if somebody, what if, what if the thought had come up to you that said, oh my gosh, she loves money. Money is the root of all evil. Oh my goodness. She's going to hell. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's the love of money, right? Do you put money above everything else? Is it your number one focus? Or is money just a tool? Is it just something to use to learn for our experience on this earth, right? Think about this. In the eternities, there is no time and there isn't any money. So maybe it's like going to school to learn how to use these tools and appreciate these tools. Because if there's no time, then do you ever feel any urgency to get anything done? It just like, I'll just do it like whenever. Right. <laughs> So time helps us to understand the importance of doing things now and money helps us understand the value of things and how we can place our time and value our time and value our resources. Money is just a resource. So how does somebody get on that frequency if they're not? So you need to start changing what you're doing, okay? <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with the people that you're around, what you listen to, the, the music, the television shows, what you're watching, anything you're reading, anything you're consuming. There are songs uh, on the radio station that will come out and they're like, oh, I'm working so hard and it's so hard to earn money or whatever. Like there are different songs that you might have heard, right? They're popular songs. Right. If that comes on the radio, it's uh, immediately I turn it off as I don't want that to go into my subconscious mind. I don't want to think that money is hard. There's a problem with money. There's no problem with money. It, like money does money doesn't have a problem, right? Money doesn't have an issue. It's it, we're the ones that have the problem. Yeah, we're money the can't change, issues. has no feelings, yeah. right? <laughs> money is just a piece of paper, honestly, right? right? But it's it's these feelings, the, these thoughts and feelings that we put into it. So it's your environment. So there are um, three different classes of people, and it's very telling where their thoughts are. There is, I'm going to call them the working class. They are working for a paycheck. Their thoughts are transactional. I'm going to put in this time, punch a time clock, get a paycheck, and then I'm going to pay for my rent and my food so I can continue to do this forever. And they usually are watching several hours of television uh, or on scrolling on their phone. They are not doing very much to improve themselves in any way. Because what, what is value? Value, uh, excuse me, ma money is a measure of our value and what we bring to the marketplace. So if you want more money, you need to have more skills. You need to have something more to offer society so that when you come to the marketplace and want to sell your product, people see the value and what you're, the value you're offering them is greater than what they're paying. They see that they can get more from what you're offering. And so they give you money because they see that there's a bigger value there. Right. I love that. So it's your environment is, is where it starts. Well, and I really like how you talk about even the music and the shows and, and all that. I hadn't really even considered it. And I believe me, I, I definitely seek out positive things, but I had not related that to money, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, it gives us something concrete to look at. 
Yes. Right. And to, to start with. So yes. that's, that's great advice. Okay. So you do a lot of coaching now you got out of sales, right. you got into coaching. I got out of sales. Tell us a little so bit went, about that. Well, I went into entrepreneurship. It was so funny. Okay. Because, um, I got a new boss after I'd been with my company for 14 years. This was the big fortune 500 company, you know, right. and, and I'm like, I'm their racehorse. I, I am, I am like setting records, right? We get a new boss and um, I let him know up front that I was a carrot person, not, not a stick person. Like don't, don't try to threaten me. Right. It, it, it only makes me angry. <laughs> don't, right. don't do that. Right. And we had a couple months later, we had my annual review and he basically said, Oh, you're doing good in this area, but in this area, you need to sell more. And my fire got lit There's because I said, right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know what? I recently saw a report and maybe I wasn't supposed to see it, but I saw me, me in my region, right? In the Northwest region, I saw where I was compared to all the, like there was probably 20 other sales reps in our region. And, and I was already killing it in, in the, in regular business, right? Just, I was already far and above them, but new business for the last year, this is new business and new business is harder to get than current business, right? Absolutely. New business. I was two to one in new business over every other rep. And I here you is, want you to change. Oh my goodness. Yes. And then I realized that this was kind of the, the MO of this company. They never wanted their employees to feel um, that they could coast or that they were good enough. They always try to like uh, make them feel like insecure. And I'm, I'm like, I'm done with this. Yeah. So I said, I'm just going to give you my notice. And I think you did that on like, the spot. I did. I just, I'm telling you like the fire, I'm an Aries rising. And that came up and that right. fire just was like, and, <laughs> and I, I was earning multiple six figures and I don't, think this was in 2011 when people were dying for jobs. Right. Right. And I don't think they really expected me to go through with it, but I'm like, see ya. Wow. And I will tell you this, that I, I had a lot of good friends there. I'd been there forever. As I'm leaving, I'm like, I'll come back every week. I'll have lunch. I'll do this. I'll do that. I didn't go back for two years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was just like, uh, and I, yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing was, is that we sometimes get so much uh, wrapped up in our identity and that I thought that this company was the secret sauce for my success. Yeah. Within a year, I had replaced my income. I was working three quarter time doing um, consulting work in what I had been doing. I finally got to like be there with my kids after school and spend more time with my kids. And I'm like, wow, the secret sauce wasn't with the company. It was with me. And that's where I thought my only regret from, from going out on my own was that I didn't do it sooner. That was my only regret. I'm like, what was I scared of? Well, and that's what I was going to say. That's what it comes down to is just fear, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, so I was, I was doing that uh, for a few years and then about 10 years ago in 2014, my father died by suicide and he had battled with bipolar mental health issues most of his adult life. And he wasn't diagnosed with bipolar until he was about in his fifties. And he had talked about suicide for a long time. And I pretty much knew that at some point he was going to die by suicide. He lived in my basement apartment. And my biggest concern was that my, one of my children would find him dead. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen, thank goodness, but he did He did die by suicide off property. And I inherited his small trucking company that he had. And so it, it, it kind of seems strange, but I was in logistics, which had to do with trucking, you know, and, and ships and planes and warehousing, et cetera. So it wasn't such a big, a, a big jump, but I had to go into this big client that he had, and I had to, you know, make sure that their corporate people felt secure that I knew what I was talking about. Right. Um, which I did. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I loved being in a corporate environment. So they're like, oh, there's a woman and she can talk our language. Well, wow, right. you know, how unusual. <laughs> um, but I was also dealing with something that surprised me. My father and I were not close. And yet um, I went through um, severe grief. I, and looking back now, I see that like for five months, I was in a black hole. I don't remember how I functioned. 
I would go to meetings, I would take notes. And then two days later, I'm looking at the notes and I'm like, yes, that's my handwriting. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do with these notes. And I don't even remember being in the meeting. And that's how grief sometimes kind of takes care of us, right? Yeah. Well, my dad's company was a mess. <laughs> he didn't, he hadn't, he hadn't automated anything. It was like very labor intensive. Yeah. So while I'm trying to go through this transition, I'm the executive of his estate. I'm dealing with, I'm the oldest of seven kids. I'm dealing with my younger siblings. You know, some of them are not doing well with my dad's death. They really, really are not. And um, within nine months, I had streamlined that business. So I was working one hour a week. Holy and, smokes. Yes. And um, I was, I was getting bored. <laughs> so I, that's <laughs> when I started doing business consulting, but I, that's my thing. That's, I, I have learned that my, my life's mission is to help other people simplify their life. And I do that in the ways that I have specific gifts and those gifts are, I help people simplify their lives around number one, I can see where their blocks are in getting their goals and I can see where their money blocks are and why those two things, because that's been the focus of my entire life. And so if somebody says something that's off in, in achieving goals or around money, like my little spidey senses, I hear it and I'm like, we got to talk about that because that's, that doesn't align. Right. Right. And I, and I want to point that out to people so that they can move past that. How is so, that received? If you're like, because if you talk to somebody and you're like, hey, wait a minute, stop, you know, like, yeah. are they receptive to that? So I have learned <laughs> that I, that a couple things, number one, they need to be like a close friend for, for, for them to know me that I will, I will say it without a filter. Um, <laughs> and they know me. <laughs> the other thing is I, I've learned that I need to be invited. So if you're familiar with human design, I am a projector. And for most of my life up until, you know, I started really get involved with, with human design about two years ago. I would just like share everything that I saw. And most of the time it was not well received by people because they were not ready to, to change or to see what I saw. And so now I have learned that if this person doesn't know me, I, I, I don't have like a, a, an invitation to be in their space. They don't, they don't know who I am. I need to wait for the invitation and it doesn't have to be like, oh, Lark, I invite you to tell me all about my money issues. <laughs> right. You know, it can just be like, you know, you're saying, oh, tell me more about that. And then I will right. share more. And then it might be my saying, oh, Brenda, would you like me to, to um, tell you a little bit more about what I see specifically with you? And it could be, okay, yes. Or it could be, oh, not right now. Right? right. Because I have learned that if I try to share and it's not it, they're not in the space. It's not going to go well for them. It's not going to go well for me. Then I feel rejected and sad. And, you know, so I'm just like, I just watch. Well, and it makes sense because I am very typically open to receiving, you know, whatever insights other people can. But there are some times when like I got a call over the weekend and I was just kind of feeling a little bit down. I, I was wrestling with some decisions that I had to make. And I wasn't in that space of receiving. And I got this call, uh, you know, it was full of advice. You do this and this. And I felt just beat, yeah. down, you know, yeah. even though the advice was really good, I just wasn't in that frame of mind. So that really makes sense mm -hmm. to, to wait to, for the invitation right. to share. So yeah. then it's received well. So that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked last week about woo. <laughs> <laughs> I love this sense of woo. And I, and like me, I, I know you're, because I, I didn't always used to ascribe to, you know, all things woo. And now I have opened up a space for it. And um, so tell me what that has looked like for you. Like how so, have you opened yourself up to that? Okay. So here's where we get to the hard part, right? Yes. So this time, five years ago, uh, right about this time, um, it was March, 2019. My 19 year old son took his life by suicide and he had been struggling with some mental issues that and depression that we did not know about. I had thought I had watched my children because of my father. I thought, you know, be aware. And um, he just had some things that happened all at once. And I think it was kind of a situational thing where he just is like, not worth it. And he died. And that was really hard for our family. 
Like we, five years later, you know, some of us are still, still struggling and some days can be harder than others. And before then, I will say that I have a very great relationship with God. We talk to God every day. I feel like I get um, guidance and answers and direction. Um, but it was just God in me. <laughs> you know, that that was it. I wasn't open to pretty much anything else. Right. I just was like, nope. And when my son died, I needed to find some answers. I needed what death is hard. A suicide is a hundred times harder. You're wondering, why didn't I know? Why did he do this? Why couldn't he talk to us? Why, why, why? All these unanswered whys. And you can't answer them. That's got to be one of the hardest part. They're yeah. unanswerable. Yes. And I happened to be in a group coaching program at that time. And um, it was very, it was good because what I didn't know before, before I started the group was the woman who was running it. Her mother had died by suicide when she was 11. Um, another woman had had an, a near death experience. Uh, another woman had also lost a sibling by suicide. And then another woman um, who doesn't really like to talk about this. She has spiritual gifts and sees people on the other side. So within less than a week, uh, just a couple days of my son's passing, the group leader said, Oh, this lady in our group mentioned she saw your son. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Tell me more. No you way. Know? Yeah. And so I, 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 we reached out to each other. I didn't know her. She's back East. And we just got on a phone call. I'm like, I am open to anything. And, and here's the, here's the hard part too. Um, my son and I fought every day of our lives. He was a difficult child for me. Uh, he was here to help me learn and it, it was a hard relationship. Um, and that um, my, this meeting with this lady where we talked, she said, I saw your son. I was, I was thinking of, I knew that he had died by suicide and I was thinking about him and channeling him and saying, why, what's going on? And she said, I, I went into this room where it's like a big like circus space with a bunch of tra trapeze, you know, and, and all these things. And she, there was a plexiglass between her and these other people that were up there spirits. Right. And she said, I saw him in this gray suit. He's a very handsome young man. And he was doing these trapeze um, um, flips and all these different things. And he had this look of awe on his face. That's totally my son. Uh, he was super smart. He was a freshman at the University of Utah in the mechanical engineering department. He would have changed the world. I mean, like, th but this boy, he would do explosions in our backyard. Um, there were things where I'm like, I can't believe it. I came home one day and in pulled into the garage when he was 16. He was hooking up to a propane tank, a homemade flamethrower. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, you know, and then these explosions in the backyard at 10 p.m. that rock the house. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. Yeah. This kid, he, he was just he was he was bigger than life. Right. He was he was trying to change the world. And uh, she said she saw him there and I could just see his wonder, like like he's just doing these flips and, and all these things and so excited. And when he saw this woman, he jumped off the trapeze and came down to her and put his hands up to the plexiglass. And he said, tell my mom that I love her and everything will be okay. okay. And she told me that. And, and that was when my, my heart first started to melt a little bit. I will tell you this. It took me a week after he died before I cried. I was so angry with him. I was, I was just so angry. Um, and, and that was the first time I heard that in the first week from his death, three different women came up to me and said, I have a message from your son. Tell my mother that I love her. Wow. The same message. And that's the message I needed. And then my heart started to melt. And that allowed some healing between us. And I will tell you, it's been just over five years. My son is my guardian angel. He is here to help me. He strengthens me. He helps me get through hard things. He protects me. And he's my person. 
and he wasn't my person when he was alive, right? <laughs> How things change, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm like, this is amazing. And I, I've heard him talk to me before. Like there have been times when I have felt suicidal because going through this journey has been hard. And, and he just like, let me have it. Right. And I would, I heard his voice like, mom, no. And I just know that, that he's there for me and he has so much love for me and I have so much love for him. And so like we talk about these woo things, I'm like, who am I to answer this? And I had certain conceptions about what death was or what happened after death. I thought I knew all this stuff. I, I knew like teeny tiny bit. And since my son has died, I know a teeny tiny bit more than what I knew before, but he's very much involved with us and our family. He's busy doing things. He told me once that mom, I'm, so I wrote a book, right? And he was with me. Like I could feel him writing when I was writing this book. I just felt so close to him. And the the day I published that book, it was probably a sad day for me because I felt his spirit leave. Mm -hmm. So I lost him twice, once physically and once spiritually. And the spiritually one was harder. And I'm like, son, what, where did you Wait, go? What stop. happened? He, yeah. yeah. He said, mom, I was with you when you needed me. And now I need to go help other people. I'm helping people who are struggling, who are on the earth, struggling with suicidal thoughts. I'm trying to help them make a better choice. And I'm like, okay, that's hard, but how can I say no? Right. <laughs> so I just have, have changed so much of my perspective. Um, I now invite my angels to be with me every day to help me with what I have to do. I'm all about frequency. I'm about tuning forks and making sure I'm tuning into my frequency. Um, I have all my crystals and my stones, you know, <laughs> back, back before Christmas, my husband's like, don't you think you have enough stones and crystals? I'm like, nope. And I'm pretty sure I'm getting more for Christmas, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> so I just feel like there's so many things that God has provided for us. And a lot of times in our modern world, we don't take advantage of them. Your story really resonates. I I interviewed um, a woman, Shelly Edmonds uh, Jorgensen. She wrote a memoir about her experiences and they're very, very similar. You know, her experiences with her mom who passed away were very similar to, to what you shared with your son. So that's, that's kind of cool to see those similarities, you know, mm -hmm. you hate hearing about that kind of a struggle, you know, but, um, but it's interesting how you grow from it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so tell me now, what's, how have you grown from that experience to where you are now? So I'll go back to three years before my son died. Okay. He was 16 and he was so hard for me, like belligerent, you know, argumentative and, this is a typical day. I'm walking down the hall in my home and I'm thinking about how my son Christian has upset me today. And I'm just like so wrapped up in my head and I hear a voice and this voice says, he's not the problem you are. Oh, and I stopped, stops, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I stopped and I said, I'm the parent. I'm pretty sure I know what's best and I this and I that, right? And then like this vision opened up in, in front of my face and I saw me and my son before we came to earth. And he said, mom, you're going to have a hard time being Christ-like, but I am going to help you. Wow. And I thought, here is a boy named Christian who has just told me that he doesn't believe in God, who's telling me that his mission is to help me become more Christ-like. And at that point, I started to change towards him a bit. I started to soften up, okay, less militant way in the way I interact with him, softer approach. And then after he died, like my whole interaction with other people has changed. I allow myself more grace, which means I can allow other people more grace instead of thinking, you know, you better show up with 110% your boots on, Missy, you know? <laughs> Um, if we show up at 50%, maybe that day that is our 100%. Yeah. And I've just 
said, that's what I got for today. And that's okay. And if somebody else shows up that way, I'm not here to judge them. That's, that's not my place. Um, I've changed in my way I interact with my children. I do not, I will not argue. I will not fight with them. It's not worth it. The relationship is more important than anything that they might be doing. It's, it's just not worth it. I am going to preserve that relationship. I see parenting as um, a way to be an advocate and um, a support for our children, not to be their judge, not to condemn them, not to tell them where they fell short. And um, that allows me, remember we talked about control, like yes. I just release my children because I will, I will tell you this, I, I didn't realize this until my son died. I felt the weight that if my children were not perfect and if they didn't make it back to God, it was my fault. I, I had failed. And when my son died, I realized there was nothing I could have possibly done to help him get back to God. There, He already had a savior and that savior wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I could release the responsibility, this control that I thought I had for like forcing my kids back to God and just turn it over, then I'm like, I'm just here to love them. That's my job. I'm just here to love. And that changes the way I interact with everybody. That's beautiful. I think when we really stop and think about who other people are and the value that they have, it would change how we interact with them, you mm -hmm. know, and I, and I, I have done that with people that I have been angry at or frustrated at or whatever. And I, it's hard to do in the moment sometimes because you're, you, you're so full of negative emotions, you know, but when you really stop and notice who they are, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And you don't have any idea what they might have been going through, right? what they're struggling with, right? You, you have no idea. Did, did they lose a loved one in the last week? Are they, did they find out something that in their family that there's a, a terminal diagnosis? Like we don't know. And so if we treat everyone like that, they're fragile and take care of them, take care of their spirit. We can't, we let's err on the side of being too kind. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I want people to know what you do now okay. too, because it's, it's, it's been a journey. Amazing. I know right. it has. It's just, it's fun though. Yeah. So when I wrote the book, I started doing a lot of suicide prevention work. I was speaking in the schools, talking to kids, talking to parents. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, it was in October and September is the suicide prevention month. And it had been a hard month for me. I had spoken at my son's school at the University of Utah. I had spoken at his former high school. I had spoken at the high school where my daughter, my younger daughter went to school. And it was where I had to go to tell her that her brother died that day. Mm, that is hard. There was, and, and I was in a big virtual event where it's like 160,000 viewers, right? So, so it was just, it had been an emotionally hard month. And I was just, I was feeling very suicidal because this, I'm in this, these feelings, this vibration, this frequency all the time. I'm the one that people, if they have some, a loved one or somebody has died or they're struggling, I get the text, you know, so-and-so is, you know, they just died or what can I do? And that's hard. That's yeah. hard. You relive hard. that over and over again yes, then, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm feeling very depressed. I happen to have a friend over, um, and this is a different friend. She, uh, her spiritual gift is she also <laughs> sees dead people. I love to tease her about that. Right. And she said, oh, your son's here. He has a message for you. Do you want to know? And I'm like, yes, I always want to know. And she said, he said, mom, you need to stop with this work because it's killing you. And I said, but, but I feel like it's my way, my penance, my way of making up for how I felt you as a mom. And he said, no, mom, he goes, those kids aren't listening to you anyway. Oh, <laughs> which is my son. He would totally would have said that. Right. <laughs> and I felt even worse. <laughs> he said, you need to work with the moms and help the moms so they can help their kids. 
And so about um, the spring of last year, I started doing this, this coaching for, for women. Um, it was the coach I needed 15 years ago yeah. when I was in this corporate environment, when I'm trying to do all the things and live large and trying to raise young kids and thinking I was doing it all and really, you know, not doing it all right. Not, not taking care of me. And I, I thought we can do this better. We can have the things we want in life but not at the expense of our family and not at the expense of our mental health. It's possible. So I've been doing this for the last year and really um, having a lot of success with the, the ladies that have come into my life, whether it's been financial success for them or just that they have become more calm and received clarity. I had one woman who told me my four-year-old will tell you that I'm a better mom. Oh, and it just touched awesome. my heart because I'm like, that's why I do this. Yeah. So um, about two months ago, as I was getting ready for the event where I met you, you heard me speak. Uh, I usually do an offer at the end of my my speaking, you know, just a, hey, here's a, a freebie that you can have. And God said, you need to talk about money. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, You're like, that's a left field thought. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I do talk about money, but it's like just a small part of like everything. And I said, I want to talk about peace, love, and joy. <laughs> and God said, people cannot get to peace, love, and joy if they cannot feed their family and pay their mortgage. And I think a lot of people have been feeling this crunch from the inflation and, and are struggling and are worried and concerned. And I thought, okay, that's true because if a family, if parents are struggling financially, their mindset and their um, focus is trying to keep their family together, trying to, it's all on this money. How can they help their children if they're focusing on just trying to pay the bills? How can they have that mental space to be available for their kids? And I thought, well, here I go. I do strange things. I, I, but I guess if God told me to talk about money, I'm, I'm all in, I'm going to talk about money. So I, I offered this free training on identifying your money blocks, which I now offer to people because I, I like we were talking about, how do you get into the next space? How do you move up in figuring out um, what it is your money blocks are? And I've had so much good feedback from that. Um, one woman said that she she took the training, she started doing the homework, and one week later, she got a $500 a month raise from her work. And she's wow, like, Wow, yeah. that's amazing. She's like, that, she's like, that was cool. I'm like, yes, and it's possible. And then another woman was listening to it. And as soon as she heard something that I said, she said, like, it zinged her right in the heart. And she goes, I know what my block is. I know what I need to change. And then another woman said, she sent me a message. Uh, she goes, three days later, Lark, you're the queen of money. You know, my mindset around money has totally shifted. She was wanting to do something bigger in her business. And she booked three international cruises where she was, she was going with a client on the cruise, being paid to go on the cruise. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and she's like, awesome. I get to travel and I get paid. And all of this happened like poof within a short time. And that's why I'm saying it can happen so fast if you align yourself with the frequency. Well, that's beautiful. And speaking of, you have that same that same program for my listeners too, right? Yes, of course. Yes. I will need to give you the link so you have the right link. Um, so my website is larkdeangalley.com. Uh, right now, we're in the process of, of switching this over. So it's the freebies not there at this recording, but it very well could be by the time, you know, it gets up, but I'll make sure you have the link. But, but yes, my, my thing is I want people to understand that they have the ability to change their thoughts and change their money frequency. I learned this at 15. Unfortunately, I didn't implement it like all the time because I didn't understand the formula, but at 15, I was able to manifest like going on foreign exchange to Sweden. This was back in the early eighties when there was no internet. I had no connections. I was, my parents were divorced. We had no money. I didn't know how, I just knew I was going. And I was kind of led step-by-step step on what to do and how it came to me. And that's why I'm saying it doesn't matter 
where you are financially. It doesn't matter whether or not you have the money. What you want is not tied to the money. What you want doesn't have to come through your earning the money necessarily. Like detach those. Decide that's what you want. That's a big thing though, you know, because that's not how society thinks. Yes. Right. So, I mean, we are taught that everything is based off of money and even our worth is based off of money. We're taught that all the time, all the time. Unfortunately, yes, that we we think that how much we produce, how much we earn, what we do is a is a measurement of our value. And that is not true because you could strip everything you have away from you. And the value and who you are as a being resides inside you. It has nothing to do with what you have. Um, I'll tell you this, like this is the ironic part of my talking about this whole thing with money. Um, my husband and I have done very well with money um, over the years. That wasn't the way it was always in the beginning. I grew up in poverty and I made like getting out of poverty and becoming financially independent a study for decades and it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that things started, like finally started to turn around where we were, we could spend more than $20 a month on our entertainment budget for our family of five, right? That's right. where we were. And so we start to change and change. And as you build on it, it, it can grow like that. And I totally forgot where I was going with this, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. It's a process. Right. right. Well, fantastic. Well, and it's a process that you can teach to other people because it's formulaic. Yes. There are okay, laws. Yes. There all the there are laws involved in that. So go ahead. Yes. Okay. So this is what I was gonna say. So um a lot of times, and I had uh, one person I was working with, she was like, I can't do XYZ because I don't have the money. I can't do ABC because I don't have the money. I want to give my kids this experience, but I don't have the money. And I said, Oh, it sounds like money is your God. And she's, you know, a God-fearing person. She was shocked. She was like, that's not true. I would never put money before God. And I'm, you're making money your source. You are discounting the fact that God can bring you these experiences or he can bring ways to you that have nothing to do with the money. Nothing. So she was like, I want to take my, my kids, like we want to go on a vacation to the mountains for a, a week. I'm like, okay, that's great. What can you do right now to create that frequency? She ended up taking her kids, her family up to the mountains for the day. They spent, you know, the time up in the mountains for the day and they had a beautiful experience. And I'm like, it wasn't tied to the money. Just start changing your mindset on how it has to happen or what it has to look like and start putting yourself in the frequency of what you want. The how is not up to you. No, and it's I not. think that's I I think for me, surrendering mm -hmm. that is my biggest surrender. Yeah. Is the how. But it's it it has nothing to do with you. And yeah. and let's say that you have a goal and you're so excited. You're, you know, you're like, okay, I'm a little bit worried. I don't know how it's gonna come, but I'm trusting God, right? And if I'm in that situation, and it can be the eleventh hour, I have had so many things come through in the eleventh hour. And I just would be like, okay, God, I am so excited to see how you're going to pull this off because I don't see it any way. Right, right. <laughs> Let's be excited about it because what else can you do, right? And that just shows your faith that that you're excited that that it's going to be provided for you in the in the best way for you. That's fantastic. This has been so wonderful, Lark. Thank you so much for, for being here. Do you have any other golden nuggets that you'd like to share with our audience? Oh, this is where I was going to go with this. So okay. my, my, my husband and I have done very well financially. And yet when our son died, like nothing mattered. My degrees didn't matter, any awards, any kind of money, anything we had, it didn't matter. That That didn't matter. And so here I am talking about money, saying you can have it, you can change your life, you can help your family to be in a better space, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so that, there's the irony of what I teach now. I love that. That's It's, it's really a beautiful concept and it's freeing. It's yes. so freeing when you're like, oh, my value is independent of everything else. Of everything else. Everything it else. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. All right. So where can people find you, Lark? 
So LarkDeanGalley.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I will make sure you get the special link so people can have the free training. I want people to know, you know, and and uh, if you listen to it, you do the homework, you do the work, right? It's the mental work. That's where you'll feel a shift. Perfect. 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 All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lark. What a story Lark has. I love how she has just lived life to its fullest to even in her times of tragedy and going through grief. And, you know, she's really tried to take what she has gone through and made it mean something. And I think that's such a wonderful lesson to learn. You know, so many times, at least in my life, I've, I, I don't see the value of what I've gone through until maybe several years down the road. And then I look back and go, oh, I'm really glad I went through that, even though it was really hard. And I think the key is to really find the value in what you're going through right now. I think it really helps to find that piece of gratitude for where you're at in your life right now and the value of yourself independent of what's going on. I hope that you have found value in this podcast. And if you have, would you please like and share it? I just think that it is the greatest compliment to not only me, but to Lark and to the other guests that I have on the podcast. And, and with that, I wish you well. And I hope you know that your purpose is in your story. Until next time, take care. Celebrate your dreams, let them take flight. For you are a star, shining bright in every step you take. Let your